Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, NJCTS, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, <laughs> completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of the information presented on our site. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinion made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now I'm going to turn over the introduction of our speaker to Martha Butterfield, the program coordinator of NJCTS. Marty? Thank you, Kelly, and good evening, everyone. Tonight, NJCTS is pleased to welcome Dr. Raja Kurlan from the Atlantic Neuroscience Institute at Overlook Hospital in Summit, New Jersey, to speak about current treatments for TS and co-occurring disorders. Dr. Kurlan received his BA from the University of Rochester and his MD from Washington University in St. Louis. He was a member of the faculty in the Department of Neurology at the University of Rochester from 1984 to 2009. He is also the founding and current principal investigator of the Tourette Syndrome Study Group and has published more than 50 articles related to TS. Dr. Curlan recently became the director of the Movement Disorders Program at the Atlantic Institute, the Atlantic Neuroscience Institute at Overlook Hospital in Summit, New Jersey. I'm delighted to turn tonight's presentation over to Dr. Curlan. Thank you, Marty. I'm just getting the slide started. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope everyone's having a lucky St. Patrick's Day. Uh, this evening, I'm going to summarize the main treatments for Tourette syndrome, focusing on the three most common aspects, the tics themselves, obsessive compulsive disorder, or OCD, and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD. I'm happy to address other aspects later um, during the question and answer period. I do want to point out that if I say something negative about a certain treatment, it doesn't mean that it is not good for you or your child. And in the same way, my positive comments do not mean that a treatment is better than one you are currently using. My comments are meant to be general and each individual person can respond differently to any particular therapy. This first slide summarizes the main categories of treatments for the three conditions, tics, OCD, and ADHD. Turning first to tics, I should say that some patients who have fairly mild tics do not need any particular treatment and education and psychological support uh, really is satisfactory to allow children or adults to live well with their tics. There is also a treatment approach that's not listed here. It's a non-medication approach called habit reversal treatment. This is something that's being tested around the country. It's basically a, a, a talking type of therapy where patients with tics are taught to focus on the sensations that precede their tics and then to introduce a variety of different competing behaviors to try to reduce the frequency of tics. Uh, this is starting to be used fairly commonly, although I personally don't have a lot of experience with it. But it is one of the non-medication treatments that can be considered. If a patient does have disabling tics, if they're interfering with day-to-day -day activities or causing discomfort or social embarrassment and education and support is insufficient, then it is reasonable to start with medications. The first group, the alpha agonists, are generally the first-line medications that are used. These are medications that affect receptors in the brain for a chemical called norepinephrine. With these drugs, there appears to be an indirect effect 
in reducing the effect of another neurochemical in the brain called dopamine. And as most of you know, it appears that in Tourette syndrome and tics that there's an excess or increased activity of dopamine. The two commonly used alpha agonists are clonidine and guanfacine. And soon I'll discuss the individual drugs in more detail. The second line drug, if the alpha agonists are insufficient, would be what are called the atypical antipsychotics. These are the newer family of antipsychotic medications that were introduced probably in the last five to seven years. And many of you know the names. Uh, common ones would be Risperdone and aripiprazole. Um, the atypical antipsychotics block dopamine receptors. And so they have a rational uh, use in the treatment of uh, tick conditions in which there seems to be excessive effect of the dopamine. By blocking the receptors for this chemical, there is a normalization in the dopamine activity. Although these are the newer antipsychotic medications, there has been some growing concern about some nasty side effects, uh, mainly what has been called the metabolic syndrome. And with this syndrome, uh, children or adults tend to have increased appetite, gain weight, and sometimes develop diabetes. And so there has been somewhat of a swing from a lot of initial enthusiasm for these types of medications to a, a bit of a reluctance, especially in young children. This has given a resurgence to some of the older antipsychotic medications, which are ca called neuroleptics or classical antipsychotics. Um, you probably have heard the names haloperidol, pimazide, or flufenazine. Haloperidol, or Haldol, is actually the most famous medication in the history of Tourette syndrome in that its use in the 1960s in the demonstrated reduction of tics in patients with Tourette syndrome pretty much changed the view of Tourette syndrome from being a psychological or psychoanalytic Freudian type of disorder to being recognized as a neurochemical, neurological disorder with inappropriate neurochemical transmission, namely excessive dopamine uh, effects in the brain. So one can actually thank Haldol uh, for putting Tourette syndrome onto the neurology map. Now, a fairly new option in treating tics is not a medication per se, but an injection. Uh, this is called botulinum toxin, or Botox. Uh, many of you have probably heard about the stars in Hollywood using Botox to reduce wrinkling of the face. And basically what Botox does is weaken muscles. And this is the reason that injection into the face can actually eliminate wrinkles. And for Tourette syndrome, we take advantage of this weakening effect. And we inject Botox into muscles that are causing problematic tics. Now, Botox can only be used in a few areas of the body, not throughout the body. So it's particularly useful treatment for children or adults who have one or two particularly bothersome tics. Uh, the most common areas that are injected are the neck for neck twisting or neck jerking tics, and also the eyes for people with eye closure uh, tics. Uh, another good uh, tic that responds well to Botox is when children or adults uh, clench their jaw tightly as a form of tic and often cause damage to their teeth or wear their teeth down. Botox injections into the jaw muscles can do an excellent job in eliminating that tick. One of the downsides of botulinum toxin is that it is a temporary measure and tends to work only for about three to six months. So patients tend to, who do respond well would tend to get Botox treatments two or three times a year. Now, finally, for ticks, I want to mention a new 
neurosurgical option of something called deep brain stimulation. And this is something uh, that I'll discuss in more detail later on tonight. I should say that deep brain stimulation is still considered experimental in the United States and is largely reserved for patients with extremely severe and disabling tics who have not responded or can't tolerate the usual medications. Now moving on to obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, generally for uh, patients who have disabling obsessions and compulsions, we start with a talking treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy. And I want to point out that this is a treatment done by psychologists, but it really should be done by specially trained psychologists who do have the special training in cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. And this is a very practical type of therapy, um, often occurring about once a week for around 10 or 12 weeks in which the therapists work with the patient and if it's a child works with the family to develop thinking and behavioral skills to get control of the obsessions and the compulsions. And this can be an extremely effective treatment and I've seen many times where patients respond nicely to CBT and therefore don't need to take medications. If the CBT is insufficient or ineffective and the OCD remains disabling, we generally move on to treatment with a drug class called serotonin reuptake inhibitors or selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And as the name suggests, these are medications that change the balance of another neurochemical in the brain called serotonin. And it looks like serotonin is a very important chemical in the development of OCD. And we'll talk about the individual SSRIs in a few minutes. And just like with tics, deep brain stimulation neurosurgery has now become a new option for treating patients with very severe disabling OCD who have not responded appropriately to medications or CBT. And Deep brain stimulation actually is now approved by the FDA for the treatment of o severe OCD, so it is something that uh, we'll be seeing more often. Now finally with ADHD, um, it is important to first work with the school to make sure children with ADHD have the appropriate accommodations, whether it's preferred seating in the front of the class, a tutoring, resource room, extra time to take tests, or the opportunity to take tests in a separate quiet room. Uh, if those accommodations are unsatisfactory and the child is getting behind related to the ADHD, we generally do think it's reasonable to use medications. The first-line drug is usually one of the alpha agonists, the clonidine or the guanfacine. Uh, this is a particularly good first choice drug for children who have both ADHD and tics because this type of medication can improve both conditions, both the ADHD and the tics. When the alpha agonists are insufficient or not tolerated, we generally move to a type of medication called stimulants, and most people are fairly common with this type of medication. As an, an example, the old medication called Ritalin. And even though there are warnings uh, for physicians that stimulants should not be used in children who have tics, we have learned over the years, including in some very good research studies, uh, some of which I directed with the Tourette Syndrome study group, we found very good evidence that children with Tourette Syndrome and tics usually do very well taking stimulants. They usually do not lead to any significant worsening of tics, and they can be extremely effective for helping the ADHD. So for Tourette Syndrome specialists, we usually do not hesitate to use stimulants for children who need the type of medication to help their ADHD.
There's a recently introduced non-stimulant medication called adamoxetine. This is a medication that seems to change the brain balance of a neurochemical called norepinephrine. Uh, the brand name is Stratera. And this is a useful medication and is an alternative to stimulant drugs, but tends to be less potent, uh, less effective uh, than the stimulants. Now, in this slide, we're going to review the specific medications um, that are useful for treating ticks. As I mentioned, the alpha agonists are usually the first-line medication. The original uh, alpha agonist uh, that has been used for many years is clonidine, or also known by the brand name Catapress. And this is a pretty good medication, but it's largely been replaced by a newer alpha agonist called guanfacine, or 10X. The reason catapress has been replaced is that it usually needs to be given three or four times a day, whereas 10X only needs to be used once or twice a day. Many patients do fine just with a single bedtime dosage. Also, catapress tends to cause a lot of drowsiness, whereas 10X is a much less sedating medication. Catapress is sometimes used nowadays for young children who can't swallow pills because it does come in a skin patch form, what's called a transdermal system. So it still can be a useful information, a useful medication. Uh, just recently, there has been a new a guanfacine product brought onto the market. It's called Guanfacine ER, uh, extended release. And it comes by the brand name Intuniv. This just came out in the past week. Um, I personally have not had personal experience with this new drug, although I'm not sure exactly what advantage it will have over guanfacine itself because regular guanfacine does have a pretty long action and, as I said, can be used once or twice a day. Intuniv is a once-a-day dosing. So if the alpha agonists are insufficient, we generally either add or move to one of the antipsychotic medications. Uh, the first two on this list, Risperdal and Abilify, are the two most commonly used uh, newer or a, called atypical antipsychotics. Um, both are fairly good medications. Um, Tourette specialists tend to use them a lot. I did mention the concern about the development of increased appetite, uh, obesity, and diabetes in children who take these medications. So uh, therapists are now tending to use these less often and in quite small doses. The last three antipsychotics are the classical uh, neuroleptics or classical antipsychotics. These have been around for a long time. As you can see, Haldol and ORAP are the only two medications. Of all medications, they're the only ones that actually have FDA approval for the treatment of Tourette syndrome and ticks. Uh, Haldol, I think, has gotten a bad rap um, over the years, largely because when it was first used in treating Tourette syndrome, it tended to be used in unusually high doses, whereas nowadays when we use Haldol, we know to use fairly small doses. So it's much better tolerated generally than its bad reputation. ORAP, or Pimazide, is another type of medication in this drug class. It's also approved by the FDA for use in Tourette syndrome. The main potential downside of this medication is that we need to do EKG or heart monitoring when this medication is used because it can affect the electrical activity of the heart and it can cause potential problems like passing out. Prolixin or flufenazine is a third classical neuroleptic. Uh, of the three, this is the one that I personally tend to use the most. It seems to be fairly effective and does tend to have fairly few side effects. 
see, I'm trying to move the slide forward, but not getting anywhere. If you hit your page down, or if you have arrow keys on your keyboard, hit your right arrow key. Yeah, I'm doing that, but it's not moving. Okay, can you move your, there you go. There we go. So this next slide um, discusses that group of medications we call the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs. And if you remember, this is the drug class that's used to treat OCD. And uh, this is a listing of most of the currently available SSRIs. And nafronil is one of the original members of this family, and it's actually quite a good medication. Um, I have found over the years that patients who don't respond or only mildly respond to some of the other ones, if you try a nafronil, they actually can do quite well. It's also one of those medications that can often boost the benefit if it's added to one of the other SSRIs. So it's still really quite a good medication. Selexa is one drug that tends not to be used too much anymore. It's largely been replaced by its cousin medication, Lexapro, uh, because the newer Lexapro tends to have fewer side effects in general. Luvox uh, is an older medicine that is actually not manufactured anymore by the original manufacturer, but the generic forms, fluvoxamine, are still available, although this is now not a very commonly used drug. Paxil or peroxetine is a, a medication that's been around for quite a while. Um, I think it's quite a good drug. Of all the SSRIs, it tends to sedate the most. And uh, although this is often a potential side effect to avoid, this medication can be potentially quite useful in children and adults who have quite a bit of anxiety and also those individuals who have rage attacks. And so one can actually take advantage of a little bit of the sedating effect for these problems. Fluoxetine, or Prozac, is one of the first SSRIs. It's well known to the public through the book Listening with Prozac. Uh, of all the SSRIs, this tends to be the one that's the least sedating, and sometimes it energizes patients. Uh, so I feel that it's a particularly good drug in patients who also need to take a tick suppressing medicine, which can be sedating. So adding Prozac for the treatment of OCD um, is a useful trick to avoid additional sedation. Prozac is also the SSRI probably least likely to increase appetite. So for youngsters or in children who are overweight, this is a particularly good drug in helping to reduce appetite and weight. Zoloft is a kind of middle of the road SSRI, um, not too sedating, not too energizing, and really is uh, quite a useful medication for many patients. Now next, moving on to medications for ADHD. Um, the first one listed here is the non-stimulant drug that I mentioned, Stratera. And it is a useful medication, although it generally is not as effective or as potent than all of the other medicines listed here, which are the stimulants. Um, but Stratera is a good medication for patients who have mild ADHD. And it may have some mild lessening of ticks as an effect. So it is a good medication for individuals with mild ADHD and mild ticks, usually. Now, the, all of the other ones on this list, as I mentioned, are stimulant drugs. And nowadays, uh, treatment has largely moved to the long-acting forms of these stimulants. Under the generic names, you can see them labeled with ER, which means extended release. And these are medications that can now be taken once a day, usually before school for children. Um, they tend to last throughout the school day and a little bit into the homework period, and then they wear off. Um, they're very useful in that 
uh, they produce fairly stable levels of the medicine in the bloodstream. So children don't really feel them wear on and wear off. And also, there's less social um, issues that the child does not have to leave class and go to the nurse's office to take an afternoon dose of the stimulant. So these are particularly useful medications. Uh, methylphenidate products, uh, you'll see them listed, the initial stimulants, are the ones that are usually used in patients with ticks. It looks like some of the other stimulants, the amphetamine and the dextroamphetamine products, are more likely to bring out ticks. So generally, we tend to stick with the methylphenidate stimulants. Uh, there is now a skin patch, um, a methylphenidate uh, transdermal system, which is called Daytrana. And this has become a useful medication, uh, particularly for children who have trouble swallowing pills. Now, what I wanted to do next is to move beyond medications to this new area of neurosurgery for ticks and OCD that's called deep brain stimulation. I think many of you have probably started to hear about DBS. Uh, with this uh, procedure, the neurosurgeon in the operating room will drill very small holes on both sides of the skull. Um, the holes are about the size of a dime. And in the operating room, with the use of CAT scan or MRI, the surgeon directs some very tiny wires deep into the brain in an area called the basal ganglia. And this is the area of the brain that's involved in the control of movements and thought to be disordered in patients who have tics. The, at the tip of the wires are electrodes which can produce electrical signals uh, deep in the brain. The wires come out through the skull, are fed uh, beneath the scalp, and wind down to the area of the collarbone. And behind the collarbone, the surgeon places a stimulator, which is kind of like a pacemaker for the brain, and the wires are attached to the stimulator. The neurologist can, over a period of weeks, adjust the frequency and the strength of the currents that delivered from the stimulators and uh, often result in a somewhat dramatic resolution of ticks when it's placed in certain parts of the brain and also for OCD when it's placed in other parts of the brain. As I mentioned, it's still considered uh, fairly experimental in the United States. When it's used for ticks, it is now uh, approved for the use of OCD. Um, but we generally do not consider deep brain stimulation surgery unless the patients are quite disabled and have not adequately responded to other available uh, treatments like medications. Now, there are special considerations for thinking about DBS for Tourette syndrome. Now, one is that Tourette's starts in childhood, and as many of you know, for most individuals, there's a fairly good prognosis in that about a third of patients tend to outgrow their tics in adulthood, and another third experience major improvement of their tics, although they don't totally go away. So about two-thirds of patients tend to ultimately have a pretty good outcome, and this suggests a given that, that one may not want to mess around with the brain in terms of putting wires into it or uh, supplying electrical currents, because you don't really want to cause problems uh, for someone who has a pretty good likelihood of eventually growing out of their problems. So for the most part, deep brain stimulation has been reserved only for adults. Um, adults who uh, have several years under their belt as adults and that we know that they really have not outgrown their tics and they remain quite disabling despite all available treatment. We also can't really predict which individuals will outgrow their tics and which ones will not. So 
early in childhood or during adolescence is probably not a very appropriate time to be carrying out a neurosurgical procedure. In addition, we do know that most patients respond to available medications, uh, and so we've talked uh, about the alpha agonists and antipsychotic drugs. In most patients um, with careful adjustment of medications, even with very severe tics, uh, will respond to the drugs. Another potential problem with using DBS for Tourette syndrome is that the exact target in the brain where these wires should go has not been settled. Um, there are about three different areas that different neurosurgeons around the world have used for tics, and it's still not clear which one of those are the best. There are also some special issues related to how well patients with Tourette syndrome tolerate deep brain stimulation, and I'll get back to that a little bit later. Now, in this slide, we see an MRI scan, uh, a cut through the brain from a patient with Tourette syndrome who had DBS uh, surgery performed. And in the center is the deep part of the brain called the basal ganglia. And this is the part of the brain that I mentioned is targeted with deep brain stimulation surgery. Now, if you look where the vertical and the horizontal lines intersect right in the middle, and you look about one inch to the right and one inch to the left, you see little black circles. And these are the actual electrodes of the deep brain stimulation wire. And if you look at the electrode on the right and kind of follow up and to the right going forward or to the top, if you look carefully, you can actually trace the very thin wire as it leaves the brain. And you can do the same thing with the electrode on the left of the screen. If you look it going to the upper and left direction, you can trace the electrode. Now, I mentioned that there are some special issues of tolerability for patients with Tourette syndrome. One of them is that, as you know, there does tend to be a fairly high rate of other psychiatric problems like OCD, ADHD, mood disorders, and rage attacks. And so far, we really don't have a lot of experience with DBS in patients with these other problems. So we don't really know uh, whether DBS in the part of the brain that's used for tics will worsen OCD, might worsen ADHD, might cause other problems. There just isn't a lot of experience so far. We do know that patients who have self-injurious behavior or self-injurious compulsions are probably not a candidate for deep brain stimulation surgery. And there have been patients in the, reported in the literature who had self-injurious behavior and went on to pick at their uh, wires and their stimulators and actually uh, pulled them out and caused infection and damage to the uh, function of these um, mechanics. And so we've learned that anyone with self-injurious impulses really should not have deep brain stimulation. Uh, another interesting thing about Tourette syndrome is that patients um, often will have premonitory sensations or what's called sensory tics, and these are sensations that precede the performance of the tic. Um, they're often described as uh, a variety of feelings or sometimes urges. And the part of the brain where many neurosurgeons are placing the DBS electrodes is the part of the brain that deals with sensation. It's called the thalamus. And we really don't know if placement of the electrodes there could potentially cause more problems with these sensory aspects of Tourette syndrome. So those are the slides, and I'm going to stop there and uh, answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. And I'm now going to begin to cover the questions that have been posted by the audience. Um, looking at how 
tardive dyskinesia, dyskinesia rather, develops with patients taking psychotic medication. Should we study the cases to find more similarities between the two and perhaps find a reliable etiology for TS? Uh, yes, there, that is something that's been studied quite a bit. Um, tardive dyskinesia is involuntary movements that develop after a patient has been taking antipsychotic drugs, usually for a fairly long period of time. Typically, they're not tics, but they're other types of dance-like or twisting movements called chorea or athetosis. Occasionally, they can produce tics. Um, interestingly, when antipsychotic drugs are used to treat Tourette syndrome, one almost never sees tardive dyskinesia. It's a very, very rare event with fewer than 10 cases reported in the literature. So there's something about Tourette syndrome that makes them resistant to tardive dyskinesia. We do think in tardive dyskinesia, the medication treatment results in extra sensitivity of the dopamine receptors that have been blocked with the drug. And we do think, in fact, that the similar hypersensitivity to dopamine exists in patients with Tourette syndrome. So we do, in fact, think that the mechanisms are quite similar. So it looks like the drugs cannot really induce more hypersensitivity than already exists in patients with Tourette syndrome. Uh, but fortunately, uh, tardive dyskinesia is an extremely low risk in patients with Tourette syndrome. So it's generally not a reason to avoid the use of those sorts of medications. They have other side effects, but usually not tardive dyskinesia. Would these drugs, would, would you expect to see that in, um, when you said in someone taking the medication for a long time? Uh, would it ever be used with a child? And what do you mean by long time? like years? It tends to be with years of treatment, although it is being increasingly recognized that it, it can occur with months or weeks of therapy. In their extremely rare cases where it occurs with just a few doses of exposure. And these are generally people who have schizophrenia or other severe psychiatric illnesses that are being treated with this kind of medication. OK, thank you. Um, Please elaborate more on the connection between dopamine and TS. Some doctors say it brings on tics. Others say it inhibits them. So I'm always interested in the views on this topic. Yes, there does seem to be pretty consistent evidence that there's increased or an abnormally increased influence of dopamine in the brain of patients who have tics. Uh, this is largely in this area I talked about. The, basal ganglia, which is the target for the DBS electrodes. Um, it does look like um, the brain is extra sensitive to the dopamine um, that is released in the brain. And this is why medications that block the dopamine receptors, the antipsychotics, or medications that reduce transmission of dopamine, like the alpha agonists, or drugs that reduce the amount of dopamine in the brain uh, are known to uh, predictably improve tics. So basically, any medication that tends to increase dopamine tends to worsen tics, and any medication that tends to block dopamine tends to reduce tics. OK. Um, is there a way to help adolescents and young adults who are resistant to treatment? Um, and this second part to the question, how can a parent be helpful without getting caught up with the compulsions of OCD and trying to deal with rage without getting raged upon? Um, that's a complicated question. Um, first of all, non-responsive. Um, in, in my career, I've almost never found a patient who is non-responsive. Um, it does take a lot of experience and knowledge to work with these different medications. Um, one has to do it very carefully, often very slowly, and often using a variety of combinations of medications. So I've seen many, many times patients who come in saying that they didn't to uh, tolerate a particular drug 
uh, let's say, Risperdal. Uh, but when I started in uh, small doses, just at bedtime, and adjust the medication very gradually, um, almost always we do get a good response and the medication is tolerated. So I think it's really few and far between for patients who really are unresponsive to medications. Um, there are other medicines also than, than the ones that I've, I've listed here. So there are a lot of variety of, of medications that can be tried. So I, I'm almost never seen a patient who's totally unresponsive to medications. Okay, great. Now the, the issue the of OCD and rage attacks um, is an interesting one. In most people's experience, rage attacks does tend to occur most commonly in children and individuals who have OCD. And many times um, this is because the OCD results in a mindset that everything has to be a particular way. Um, this is called mental inflexibility. Um, we call it my way or the highway or my way in the or the wrong way. And so children with OCD uh, really are very stuck in terms of how things are supposed to go. And if there's a change uh, without a lot of warning, um, they are often thrown into a rage attack. So we do find that treating the obsessive compulsive disorder with cognitive behavioral treatment or SSRI medications are often a critical first step in trying to get rage attacks under control. Uh, at the same time as educating the parent about how OCD can in fact precipitate a rage. So in these children, for example, you almost never want to change your plans. You want to tell the child as far ahead as possible that what they expect to happen on a particular day has been changed and give them plenty of time to plan. They're never last minute people. And interestingly, uh, OCD is genetic in families. So one often has a child with OCD bumping heads with a parent with OCD. And both of them think they're right and they obsessively believe the other one is wrong. And uh, this can precipitate rage attacks. And so really understanding the dynamics of what goes on in the family and the thinking process is really important, particularly when rage attacks coexist with OCD. Okay, great answer, thank you. Um, I have a question about stimulants and ADHD. Stimulants speed up the body, but the overall effect uh, on a child with ADHD is to typically relax them. So would you elaborate a little bit on how this works in the body? It's, this is something called a paradoxical effect, paradoxical meaning the opposite. And for people who do not have ADHD, stimulants do in fact cause a, uh, you could call it a speeding up of the body. People do tend to feel more alert. Their pulse gets faster. Um, they often feel energized. But you, you generally do find the opposite occurring in patients with ADHD. You see them being able to pay more attention. They're less hyperactive. They can sit still and be less distracted. And the basic mechanism for the paradoxical effect is not known, although it is thought that the neurochemical imbalance in the brain of people with ADHD is quite different from people who do not have ADHD. And so it wouldn't be surprising um, that they respond differently to this kind of medication. All right, thank you. Uh, let me see. I have a parent with a 13-year-old who has depression. And when he's put on antidepressants, he has increased tics. Uh, what would you recommend in that situation if he were your patient? And I don't know if this is a question you're, you want to answer, but I'm putting it out there. Uh, sure. Um, depression is something that commonly occurs in patients with Tourette syndrome. Um, I would say that it's very, very unusual for the SSRI medications to worsen tics. Um, the medications that affect serotonin usually have very little effect on tics. 
some of the antidepressants that affect a different chemical called norepinephrine, um, some of them uh, like Cymbalta or Effexor or some of the older medications, they do have a tendency to worsen ticks sometimes. But um, I, I would try to uh, work with a different SSRI medication to find one that does not worsen ticks. Um, if that's not possible, which I, I think would be very unlikely, I would probably combine an SSRI with a medication to suppress the ticks. So if the child really needs their antidepressant medication, then you've got to find a way to um, get them to take it. And uh, using a second medication to reduce the ticks um, is an option. Okay. Um, is there a behavioral treatment plan that is suggested for patients with rage attacks? Uh, are there any resources about that you could suggest? Um, yes, uh, there's a lot of books about OCD and ADHD, and usually buried in those, there are discussions about rage attacks. Um, there's a book that was published a few years ago called Teaching the Tiger. And um, it was just recently, a new edition just came out. And I think it was called Tigers 2, T-O-O, -O, the name of the second edition. And it is a wonderful book um, that specifically talks about children who have Tourette syndrome, OCD, and ADHD. And there are some excellent um, chapters in there about behavioral interventions. The author's name is Cheryl Pruitt, P-R-U-I-T-T. And I think this is an indispensable book, especially for parents with children who have multiple problems and also uh, teachers and school psychologists. OK, thank you. Um, hold on one second here. Um, I have a question about a study that Johns Hopkins is doing on Tourette patients that uses dopamine. If dopamine causes the problems that you've described, uh, can you help explain why they might be studying that if it seems clear that we know it's not helpful? Uh, sure. I actually was the leader of that study, which is now over. Um, there had been some early reports that drugs that increase dopamine might, over time, improve ticks. Uh, these were reports from very small numbers of patients, about ranging from about 5 to 12 patients. And the rationale for it is that if you give a low enough of a medication, a small enough dose, it actually preferentially stimulates the receptors on the first nerve cell, um, the one that is about to interact with the next nerve cell at a place called the synapse. And the synapse is the site where two nerve cells communicate with each other. And if you stimulate the dopamine receptors on the first nerve cell, it actually reduces the amount of dopamine that's released by the cell. So even though it's counterintuitive, um, the very small dose of the medication, which is the one that's being looked at or had been looked at, would have a rationale of reducing dopamine um, from the nerve cell. A second potential rationale is because we do think the receptors on the second nerve cell might be super sensitive. If you give these dopaminergic or dopamine-influencing medications to these supersensitive receptors, you would expect that initially you would worsen ticks. But if you keep bombarding them with this patient, that you might be able to do what's called desensitizing them. Um, so that with continued use of these medications, they'd actually become less sensitive. And so those were the two hypotheses uh, about why a dopaminergic medication might help. Um, it, it, the chemistry of the brain is fairly complicated, and it's not as simple as, as what uh, you've been told in terms of just extra dopamine transmission in the brain. 
it's very fluid and things can change on both sides of the synapse. Um, so with that hypothesis, um, there was a fairly large study that was just recently completed. It was funded by a drug company and I was the main investigator. And it, it did turn out that um, there was no evidence that this medication was any better than a placebo. So probably the use of those kinds of medicines uh, will end. Okay. I have to apologize for the noise in the background. I'm not sure where that's coming from, but it's not here. So I just hope that's not disturbing anyone. Um, I have a I have a question about um, as a patient enters adolescence, what is the likelihood of an increase in ticks and or OCD? Uh, if you look in the old literature about Tourette syndrome, it's commonly written that ticks tend to worsen in adolescence or when um, children are going through puberty. But I've actually not had that experience in uh, my care of patients with Tourette syndrome, I, I usually do not see any uh, predictable worsening of ticks during that time period. And uh, we did a study fairly recently to find out about what age the ticks do tend to improve, if they're going to improve. And it turned out that the age range of 12 to 14 years was the most common age in which ticks actually start to settle down. Um, so, I The number of minutes remaining in your conference is five. If you need more time, the conference will automatically be extended for as long as possible. So I, I don't really think it's predictable that symptoms will worsen during adolescence. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for that interruption, too. We've never had that kind of come in the middle of everything before. Um, any thoughts about clonopin and ticks? Uh, clonopin is one of those extra med medications that I didn't put on here that we sometimes use. Um, it does not seem to have a direct effect on ticks. That's one of the reasons I did not include it. Um, it is an anti-anxiety medication or what's called a minor tranquilizer. And so with individuals who are anxious or under a lot of stress, um, and anxiety and stress do tend to exacerbate ticks. Um, sometimes it's useful to use a medication to calm them, and what you'll find is that um, secondarily the ticks will improve. So we occasionally use it um, in addition to some of the other medications. Okay. And it looks like I'm down to one more question. Uh, do you know why a doctor would prescribe for an older TS patient Dopamine against Mirapex. I'm sorry, I'm, at, oh, dopamine agonist. Right. This okay. is, this and the, the uh, question is further, the person is no longer on it, but she worries now that there might be a long-term PS side effect. Right. This is the type of medication that I talked about related to the study at Johns Hopkins and other centers. This is an example of one of these dopaminergic medications. They stimulate dopamine receptors. So I, I mentioned the rationale for considering them for research. But as I said, the research has shown that they are not helpful. Um, this person should rest assured that there would be no long-term effects on their ticks. OK, great. Um, I have one more. Uh, in, your, um, in your slide, you place CBT in the OCD treatment category. Um, is it used only in the treatment of OCD, or is there a place for it in treating TS? Well, some people consider habit reversal therapy as a form of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, others just consider it a form of behavioral therapy. So it, it depends where you put that um, sort of treatment. But cognitive behavioral therapy, per se, has largely been studied mostly in OCD and is uh, most proven for OCD. The classic cognitive behavioral therapy typically is not used for the treatment of ticks. Um, the habit reversal treatment, which does have some similarities, is starting to be used in some places around the country. 
I actually don't like habit reversal therapy myself because the uh, child or adult is trained to uh, carefully focus on all the sensory uh, and movement feelings and urges that they experience before they tick. And then they're taught to introduce some other kind of uh, thinking or movement to eat with the production of a tick. And one thing that has never been assessed in children being treated with this is what happens to their attention span. Um, and I think there's a very good chance that if the child is being taught to focus on their The number of minutes remaining in your conference is 1. If you need more time, the conference will automatically be extended for as long as possible. So if the child is taught to focus on the sensations in their ticks, I think it steals some important attention that is more pr positively directed into the classroom and elsewhere. And usually uh, my approach is to try to get people to really not focus on their ticks and to try to uh, live a normal life without constantly obsessing or thinking about their ticks. And so the habit reversal therapy also goes somewhat against this. But uh, I'm open-minded about it, and I'll wait to see uh, what the research shows. Um, I, as I mentioned, uh, it is interesting that the research that has been done or is underway have, have never assessed the attention or focusing uh, or the classroom performance of children who are being treated with habit The conference has been extended and will continue for as long as possible. I apologize for that. I, I will make sure that this happens never again. Thank you. And so I, I kind of have my um, concerns about habit reversal therapy for ticks. Okay. I'm going to ask you a couple more questions that have come in about medication. And I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing this incorrectly, but this adult, this individual has been prescribed Baclofen. B-A-C-L-O-F-E-N. Baclofen. Okay. And would like to know a little bit about that and its effect on TS. Yes. Baclofen is a medication that has effect on a different chemical in the brain called glutamate. And there were some initial case reports and one report of a group of patients who responded um, to baclofen, that is that their ticks did improve. Uh, but when it was tested in careful scientific fashion with the use of a placebo, um, generally it didn't seem to have any significant effect on ticks. Okay. And I'm going to close with a, someone looking for statements. If, they, if, if you were to give one statement of advice to a, a, a youth with TS, what would that be? The most important treatment is whatever intervention is needed to maintain their self-confidence. And I think that living with Tourette syndrome can turn from a, a problem to an opportunity for self-growth self-strengthening, and actually learning how to cope with life's problems. And I think that is the most important message for uh, a child or an adolescent with Tourette syndrome. Well, thank you. I think that ends uh, tonight's question on kind of an upbeat note. So thank you, Doctor. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining our webinar on medications, Botox, and deep brain simulation. There is an expert survey which should show on your screen as you exit. Please fill out the evaluation, and this discussion board will be open tomorrow and available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website for any additional questions that were not covered in tonight's presentation. This website is www.njcts.org. Also, an archived recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to the site. Our next presentation will be on school refusal and anxiety, presented by Dr. Brian Chu, and is scheduled for April 14th. This ends tonight's webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Kurland, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending.